Uh, but researchers over the last few years have been looking into and studying about uh, a human's need to be noticed. Have you, ever, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you wanted to be noticed or seen? Have you ever been in a job situation where nobody noticed the work that you were doing and how frustrating that must have been or what that season looked like for you? Uh, professor and author Dan Airely did a, did a test study in a workplace. They paid employees um, to look over, th- look over sheets of paper. So they would hand them a sheet of paper and it was full of letters. And the job was to find sequenced letters, highlight them and turn it back into the boss. Sounds like an exciting job, doesn't it? paper by paper, sheet by sheet. But the, 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 the part of it that was a twist is that the pay was on a scaled basis, meaning the, the, the further you got into the work, the less pay you got. So the more papers you did, the less pay you got. Doesn't sound very fun at all. Uh, but what the three employees didn't know is that the people were placed into three different groups. They were the acknowledged, the ignored, and the shredded the acknowledged, the ignored, the shredded, okay? So the first group, what would happen? They would fill out the paper. They would take it to the boss. They would have the highlights where the sequence letters were. They would turn it to the boss. The boss would look at it, check the work, file it away, and put it in the filing cabinet, hand them a new sheet, and they would go back and work again. The second group, the, second, the, the ignored group, they would take the sheet of paper that was highlighted, take it to the boss. They would turn it in. The boss wouldn't look at it, but he'd put it in a file, and he'd put it in the filing cabinet. Now, the third group, which I would have loved to have been the boss on this one, they brought the paper to them, and the boss did not look at it, and he leaned over and put it in the shredder and handed them a new piece of paper. I don't know if I could have kept a straight face being the boss at that moment. But as you might imagine, the acknowledged group completed more and performed at a higher pace. They completed a third more of papers than the other two groups combined. But the shocking part of the study was that there was almost zero difference between groups two and groups three, the ignored and the shredded. The only thing that made a difference in the entire study was that the work was being acknowledged. There's something about it in our human nature, I believe, that we enjoy and we like to be acknowledged and seen and noticed. I mean, if you are, if you are at like at beginning of the year, what happens every, every year, people start getting into diets and I'm going to eat right and I'm going to work out and the gyms are busy and all that. And if, and if nobody notices that you're not losing weight, like what, what does that look at? You're like, ah, I just want to quit. I don't want to do it anymore because nobody's noticing. There's a sense inside of us that we want people to see what we're doing and what we're working on and what we're working towards. And I, I believe that if we're not careful that same sense of wanting to be noticed can manifest in us as followers of Jesus in our walk with Jesus. That we've read the Bible and we've been praying and we've been serving, we've obeyed the commands of the Lord to the best of our abilities and we're tithing, we're doing all these things and it's like, I just want somebody to notice that I'm doing good in my walk with the Lord. Now we would probably never say that out loud. Most of us wouldn't say it out loud, but we might think it. I just want somebody to notice that I'm growing in my walk with the Lord. I'm doing right. I'm reading the Bible. And so I'm going to post on Instagram every day my Bible on the table perfectly, right? And so I want people to notice that I'm doing my devotion. Because if it's not on Instagram, you probably didn't do your devotion, right? Paul, in today's passage, um, when we think about being noticed and, and, and acknowledged, and today, if I could say this in the most pastorally way possible, Paul's going to rip that thought to shreds. There are some times in the Bible where, especially with Paul, Paul will say things nicely and encouraging and pastorally, and it's like, wow, that's just so, I love that. And then there's times where he doesn't. This is one of those times today, all right? And so as we read the passage today, you're going to start picking up on this tone that Paul has. But at the same time, it's, it's a beautiful passage, as only Paul could do. He blends the two of being direct and strong and pastorally and loving. So let's look at Philippians chapter three, and we're gonna be in verses one through 11. If you're new at this, we've been in Philippians for quite a while now, uh, since the week after Easter, I believe. And so uh, what we do here is we, at Collective, we take a big book of the Bible, we study it, we, we, we read it, we learn it, we grow it, make it applicable, and we send you out into the world to make it happen, all right? So let's look at verses one through 11. It says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, and look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. 
Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered for the the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that that which comes through the faith faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And by any means possible, that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Can you feel the tone a little bit with Paul? It's like this feels kind of like a fatherly, good dad talk. You know, when your dad would pull you off to the side and give you that talk that you needed, you need to straighten up, you need to kind of correct some things in your life. That's the feeling that I get when I read this passage and been studying. But Paul is writing to this young Philippian church who's just 10 years old, which sounds old right now with us only being less than a year old, maybe half a year old now. Um, But when you think about the longevity of a church, the historical factors of a church, 10 years really is not that long of a time. And so it's a beautiful passage here. The main idea, if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this down. Confidence in the flesh diminishes when our boasting in Christ grows. Confidence in the flesh diminishes when our boasting in Christ grows grows. This is a great picture of the upside down kingdom of God. The, the kingdom of God, when we say that, we're talking about the people of God, the, not the church, not our kingdom, not a kingdom we're building, but the kingdom of God, the people, the capital C church. We are a part of this kingdom that feels upside down at times because many times when it comes to the scriptures, what, what the world wants us to celebrate is the exact opposite of what Christ wants us to celebrate. What the, the, the world might say, look at me, but the scriptures will scream, look at Jesus. And oftentimes, I wonder if we focus more on the former. If we just want somebody to notice us, we just want to be seen. And I'm not saying that that, that nature inside of us is bad because we need to be acknowledged. We need to be noticed. We need to be cared for and loved and shepherded. Oh, uh, however you say that, whatever I'm trying to say there. You, you, we need that in our lives. I was going to try to fix it, but if I fix it, it's going to get worse. You ever, you ever done that before? Try preaching. But oftentimes we, we focus on the former where we want the world to see us, the work that we've done. But Paul is urging us and driving us saying, listen, don't look at that. Let's look at verse 1. We're going to go verse by verse this morning. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Now, if you were to sit down in one sitting and read the book of Philippians, this passage would kind of feel like an out of, out of place or um, like it was just kind of like, wow, that came out of nowhere. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and they turn the conversation and you don't know how you got into that one part of the conversation? You're thinking, what were we even talking about originally? That's kind of the feeling that it is if you sit down and read this letter uh, the, to the Philippians, Paul's been talking about all these different things about unity, community, and this can kind of feel like a tangent, a rabbit trail, so to speak. But it's one of my favorite passages, and there's been some scholarly debate on the validity of this passage. If you were to go and look at commentaries, you might see some of that. But the majority of scholars believe this is Paul's writing. They believe that um, he was not set to a certain literary structure, and so he could write however he wanted to. And if he was writing in the prison cell in Rome, he could go off on a rabbit trail if he wanted to and encourage and lift up and try to bring this church into maturity. So Paul starts this section off with the phrase that keeps coming up. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. He said this twice in the previous chapter, and really a theme throughout the entire book is rejoicing no matter what our circumstances look like. There's a difference between happiness and joy. We hear that all the time, right? Happiness is based off of your circumstances. You're happy if your husband surprises you with a new car. It's like, wow, you know, you're so excited. And you got the big red bow from Christmas, like the Lexus commercials. Like that, you're happy when that happens. 
But joy is not de- determined on our circumstances. And so Paul keeps encouraging us, listen, d- just rejoice in the Lord, no matter what you're facing, no, no matter how hard and how difficult it must be. And this church for sure had faced difficult situations, being in a Roman colony, 800 miles away from Paul, living as Christ followers in a culture that did not, did not honor, did not respect the, the way of the Christian walk. You know they're facing difficulties. And Paul's saying, rejoice no matter what you are facing. If we would listen to the words of Paul, it would do well to our soul to rejoice in the middle of difficult times. Why, why should we rejoice? We don't rejoice because of the work that we're doing. We rejoice only because of the work that he has done in our lives. Some of you... Even today, as you're hearing that, it's bringing up all kinds of emotions and frustrations and disappointments. And today, maybe your response today after the message or after the sermon, you go home and you're processing. Maybe your response is just simply to look at your circumstances and say, thank you, Jesus. As difficult as that may be, as, as backwards as that seems, Paul says, it is no trouble to me to write the same things to you again meaning I'm going to keep writing them and I'm going to keep telling you to rejoice and I'm going to keep writing it until you get it. You, you know, like if, if you're a parent and your children are disobeying in a certain way and they keep doing the same thing over and over, what do you do? You keep correcting over and over until they get it. And it's kind of the feeling that Paul is like, hey, listen, you're not rejoicing. So I'm going to keep telling you, no matter what you're facing, rejoice. Correcting this thought of being down because you're facing difficult situations. And he says he, to rejoice because it is safe for you. How is rejoicing in Christ safe for us? Um, I don't know if you've ever had this feeling before, but when life kind of gets the speed wobble to it, do you know what the speed wobble? Our, one of our family's favorite traditions is to watch America's Funniest Home Videos. We still watch it, like it, it, even now, and they're just as cheesy as they were years ago when you were growing up. But it is, it is, it's a blast to watch. But you know what the funniest videos are? When someone gets hurt every time. It's like, oh, that guy, he might have died. That's funny. Like, like at, and then you catch yourself and you're like, I don't know why I'm laughing at that. But the speed wobble is in those viral videos when somebody's riding a, a skateboard down a really steep hill and they're laughing and they're smiling and their friends are videoing it in the car. And then all of a sudden the skateboard starts to wobble like this, you know, like, and, and then they're not smiling anymore. That's, that's the speed wobble. And sometimes life can feel like that, can it? Sometimes life has that feel to it that the, it feels like the wheels are coming off and you're starting to wobble a little bit. Finances are tight, your marriage is, is struggling, your, your kids are disobeying, and all these things are going on, and you feel like, ah, I'm out of control. Paul's, I believe what he's trying to get across to us is when life kind of has that wobble to it, and it's out of control, and it's difficult, it's stressful, and he's saying, keep rejoicing, because rejoicing will recalibrate your heart. When you feel like that the Lord is not in control of your life. When you feel like the Lord has no, no plan for your life at the moment, rejoicing in what you have and what he's already done and the work that he's already done in your life, recalibrate your heart. Because when your life feels like you're out of control, you can put your heart and intention on the one who is in control. And there's one thing that I've learned in my short life is that he is the only sure thing in this world. He is the only sure bet in this world. We put our trust and our faith in him. We walk in him. We follow him. And, and, and there's, there's, it's never going to come back to us negative. It's never going to come back to us in a bad way. And Paul says, keep rejoicing. That's a good verse too. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. And look out for those who mutilate the flesh. We are, for we are the, of the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in in the flesh. Now we kind of get into the meat of the passage for the day a little bit. And Paul gives the Philippians these three warnings. Look out for the dogs, evildoers and mutilators. Now we don't know exactly who these people were. Paul doesn't mention them by name, but most likely they were Jewish believers. They came into this, this Roman colony and tried to correct some things that they thought were wrong with the Christian theology. And so they start adding on to these rules and they start saying, you got to do this, you got to do that. It's kind of a, 
you know, this, this faction of Jewish believers, if you're new to the Bible or need a refresher, the Israelites, the Jews are God's chosen people. God chose them. He led them out of slavery in Egypt. He led them into the promised land. He'd been their people. He had, he'd, he'd been their God. He'd been their king. You know, they finally asked for kings. They finally asked for judges. Lord, turned them over to the worldly system. And, but these are God's people. These are the Jewish people. They followed the Torah, which is the law, the first five books of the Bible. But when Jesus came, he made it possible for Gentiles or non-Jews, more likely you and I, I assume that most of us in this room are not of Jewish descent. Made it possible for you and I to become believers in Jesus. And so now these Jewish men were trying to influence the Philippian church to be circumcised, which was a religious law for the Jews, but not common for the Gentiles. And so they're coming in and saying, you've got to do this. And Paul calls these people dogs. Now in our culture, it's like, oh, like you're automatically thinking of like your little puppy at home, right? He's like, I love dogs. Uh, Lindsay and I are not the best pet people. Like we don't, like we like some pets, like, but we like sending them off more than we like keeping them. Like we just never been that kind of like, I, I don't know, like in my family growing up, we would have dogs and then like, they would just go away. Like, I don't know what my dad did to them. <laughs> like I have questions, dad, if you're watching, okay? Like we'd have a dog and then it'd just be gone. Like, well, you know, he went away. Like, what does that mean, dad? Let's, let's talk about that. But Paul calls these people dogs, and he, which sounds cute, but in this culture, dogs were considered despicable. He said, you are dogs. Now, he says, evildoers. These men were trying to take away from the Gentiles authenticity or adding on, or they were questioning their genuineness in their relationship to the Lord. And he says, mutilators. Paul basically saying, claiming that the Gentiles being circumcised was as of no value or was as equal value to just mutilate your flesh because there's pointless. You don't have to do it. There's no need for it. And he says, watch for these people. Now, this is not an issue for us today. And I apologize for the parents. I might have some questions after service with their children, but you, you get what I'm saying? Like, this isn't an issue for us today, but if you, if you really look at it, there's things in our world. I'm sure there's people saying crazy things they're starting cults and all kinds of crazy things up in the mountains and trying to get people to join them, Waco, wherever they're at, right? But <laughs> some of you are like remembering flashback. They're saying crazy things, but that's not really an issue for us. And, and Paul says, watch for these people. But we do have people that are continually adding or trying to add to the faith. It's kind of a, the gospel plus this. The gospel plus rules, the gospel plus dress, the gospel plus actions. It's like they, they want to take the gospel, the message of the gospel, that we are sinful, broken people, and we were rescued by a gracious and a loving savior. savior. They would take that and they say, no, we're going to add on a couple of things to it because we don't feel like that's enough. It's Paul saying, watch for these people that are trying to add to your faith. They're trying to add, they become legalistic. And sure, I, I want to reiterate this, is that we, what, what I'm not saying is that, I, that the Lord doesn't want you to obey. It's not what I'm saying. I think we should strive for obedience. We should strive for discipline. We should strive to do the things that the Lord asks us to do. But when it comes to salvation and his saving grace, there is no add-on. It's only Jesus. And Paul's saying, watch for the people that will add on to these things. We are of the circumcision because we worship in spirit and we glory in Jesus. That putting our faith in Jesus allowed us to become part of the people of God, the circumcision, the part people of God. And so our confidence is not in our flesh. For them, it was their physical flesh. But for us, it's our fleshly desire to, to earn love by obedience. And if you have grown up or came from a legalistic culture and a church culture, I want you to hear me today. You cannot earn God's love anymore by being more obedient. And that is a, it can be a stepping, uh, like a, a hindrance to people at times because they feel like, well, if, if I'm not obeying everything, because the opposite of that is this, is that if we buy into the adding on and adding on, then we equate our relationship with God simply by obedience. We could never pick up our Bible and read and study the scriptures and memorize scriptures and learn from the Lord, sit with the Lord. But as long as we're not sinning, we feel like we're doing good spiritually when that's the exact opposite of what the Lord came to do. It's about relationship. It's not about rules. It's about relationship. 
And so watch out for the dogs that will try to add to the faith and make you jump through hoops. But the reality is it's only Jesus. He's the only sufficient one. Let's look at verse four. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a, as to the law of Pharisee, as, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now, in this section, Paul paints this beautiful self-portrait of himself. This is, in our times, this is what a good social media bio looks like. Right? It's like, it says like believer, perfect marriage, three obedient children, one rescue dog. Oh, and I give the world vision. Like it's, it's, Paul's writing this portrayal of himself and it's like, like this, look who I am in the flesh. Look at me, look at me, look at me. But what Paul is trying to communicate to the Philippians is that in response to the Jewish believers adding to their faith, he says, if anyone has reason to boast in the flesh and the rules and the laws, I have it. And if anyone thinks that they have it, I have it more. And he gives us this list of reasons, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, a persecutor of the church and blameless. Paul's trying to show them like, listen, if, if it's about like the fleshly things, if it's about rules and laws, like I beat everybody, I've got it. And we don't have time to go through this whole list today, but I, I wanted to point out just a couple of, couple of them. Paul could trace his lineage all the way back to the people of Israel and the specific tribe that he was born into, which was the tribe of Benjamin, he just said there. Benjamin was a son of Jacob and Leah. If you uh, remember back to the tribal time of the Israelites, uh, Leah, Leah's favorite child was Benjamin. I know you're not supposed to have favorite child, children, but evidently they did back then. The Benjamites is who Saul came from, King Saul, the first king of Israel, right? And so there's, there's this history and this, li this lineage uh, of greatness in the tribe of Benjamin. And Paul's saying, I come, I can trace my family history all the way back to the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews, it says. Now, what that means is that Paul was born into this very Hellenistic culture. Hellenistic meaning that when the Romans were in power and in control, they were going all throughout the region and imparting their power and strength into everybody. And so Greek and Roman culture became the norm. It infiltrated the church. It infiltrated the Jewish religion. It, it infiltrated everywhere. People started speaking common Greek because of the, the Hellenizing of the culture. And Paul's saying, listen, Amongst all of that, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul was a very, he was, you know, bilingual, probably more than bilingual, maybe multilingual with Aramaic as well. But what he's saying is like, I, I didn't just give a, I, I'm still fluent in Hebrew. The language of God's people. Like, I, I, I've got it. I, I, he gives us this list and, and, and even through all that, Paul's saying, I'm a, Jews, I'm a Jew of Jews, so to speak. If anyone could boast, it was Paul. Let's look at verse seven. But whatever, I, whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss in all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Now, Paul goes from this beautiful self-portrait of himself, right? And he's like, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm this godly person on the flesh. I've got all the rules and all the laws. I've got it. I persecuted the church because they were wrong. I've got all this stuff. And then what does he say? It's all a loss. All of what he just went through, the list of reasons he could boast, it's a loss. It's, it, it, I want to show you a picture kind of, of what Paul drew. He started off with this beautiful portrait of himself, and this is what Paul ended up with as we switch to the next verse. He's drawing this port of, beautiful portrait of himself, and he's like, it's almost like he just gets frustrated. He's like, it's all nothing. It means nothing. 
I can obey and I can do all these things. But the, having this list of rules and o, 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 trying to obey my way into, into honoring Christ, trying to earn my way to Christ by the law, I can't do it. It's worthless. It's pointless. This is a direct contrast to the portrait that he just painted. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. Meaning this, if you were to take all the reasons that Paul had just listed out, the eight reasons that he listed out and you put it on one side of the scale and you put Christ on the other side of the scale, Christ is always going to win. He's saying, listen, you could take all this stuff. You could take all the world's religions. You could take all the legalism, all the rules, all the laws, all the reasons that I had confidence to boast, put it on one side, but Christ is still going to win. And it's a beautiful picture, beautiful picture of the, the love and the care and the respect that Paul had for the Lord. I want to make a special note this morning of the personal side of this passage that Paul says, knowing Christ. This is not in a corporate sense. He's talking to the individuals here. Yes, he wants the church to know Christ, but he's saying to the individual, it's all lost for the sake of knowing Christ. All the things in my personal side that I could boast, it's all lost because I know Christ. And I wanna encourage you of all the things in this world that you could invest in and you could, you could work in and do, you will never find a more sure thing than investing in your relationship with Jesus. Paul is telling us over and over in this passage that knowing Christ personally is greater than anything that he's ever seen in this world, anything that he's ever experienced in this world, that they don't come close, they don't compare. And as I was studying this message, this, this, this message, this question just kept coming back in my mind. Are, are we, are you, am I spending ample time investing in my relationship with Jesus? It's a question that we're all gonna have to answer for ourselves. Are we, am I, are you spending ample time in our relationship with the Lord? And that's gonna be different for each and every one of us. I have a pastor friend of mine. He wakes up so early every morning, spends hours, literally hours with the Lord. Like, and I, think, I, I see him, I'm like, I, I wanna be like you, but that, like, my alarm clock, for some reason, it, won't, it doesn't go off before 6 a.m. It's something with it. I don't know if it's broken or something. I don't enjoy waking up that early, right? And so, but this person, he like wakes up at four in the morning and he prays for a couple hours, he reads his Bible for an hour. He's walking around and like, and he's a pastor friend of mine and gets, gets to his church staff. His staff gets there like eight o'clock and he's already been there for four hours praying. It's like, so it's gonna look different for all of us, right? But the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we spending enough time with the Lord? And I don't ask you that out of judgment. I don't ask you that to make you feel bad about yourself or where you are at spiritually. But the thought that just kept coming back to me is that Jesus is not something that we just add into. It's not like a topping we put onto our life. He should become the lens that we see everything in our life through. And Paul's saying, all this worldly things, all the fleshly things that I could boast in, it's all a loss. Are you growing in your love and your affection for the Lord? Are you opening up the scripture? I pray that there's a hunger and a depth that, that is gonna grow inside of each and every one of us more and more for, for the scriptures, for his word, for sitting in his presence and let, allowing his word just to fill our lives. And I, especially during this time, if I could give you any encouragement right now, it'd be turn the news channels off and let's read the Bible. It's only gonna stress you out. No matter what channel you put it on, you're only gonna hear a one-sided story of it. So you might as well ignore that and let's focus on the scriptures. Let's focus on our relationship with him. Paul even goes as far to call them rubbish in verse eight. I count them all as rubbish. Now this, is, <laughs> this word in the Greek is a vulgar term for the phrase human excretion. If I was to say what this word translated as, really, y'all would be really mad at me. There'd be people really, I'd get some emails. I can't believe the pastor said this. Paul said it. <laughs> That'd be my only response, but I'm not gonna say it. Paul says it, it's a pile of human manure, basically. 
all the list of rules and reasons why I could boast and say, look at me and look what I've done and look how good I am. Paul says, they are a pile of human manure compared to the worth of knowing personally my Savior, Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thought. Do you see the treasure in which Paul sees Jesus? Do you see that? This passion that Paul has for Jesus. Like, I, I just imagine this, this paper that Paul is writing on soaked full of tears as he's writing this passage. Like, listen, this is all garbage. This is all garbage. I could boast in a lot of things, but I, I don't boast in any of it because it's all a pile of manure because I have the opportunity to follow and be with Jesus. All the while writing it from prison. Because if we have Christ, we have everything. Let's look at verse nine. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that come, the, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul is emphatically saying our righteousness does not come from the, our own works. It only comes from the work of Christ. That our ability to obey and to be disciplined and to do all the things that we feel like we need to do at times, none of that matters because it doesn't give us the righteousness. It matters in a sense of obeying and being honoring to the Lord and growing in your relationship with the Lord. But when it comes to salvation and righteousness, it's all a pile of rubbish. But how many times do we do the opposite? Well, I'm doing this and I'm, I'm being disciplined in this area and I'm growing in this area and all those things are great. We need to be growing in love. We need to be growing in discipline in our relationship with the Lord and doing what he's asking us to do. But the focus should never be on our own work. The focus continually has to be on the work that Jesus is doing in us. Because the law can't save our souls. I was Part of the whole reason the law came to show us, to, to set the people apart, but also to show the people that the law can't save you. But Jesus, but Jesus, the more that we boast in his work in our lives, the less we desire to put our own work in the spotlight. Think about that for a moment. The less that we boast in his work and what he's doing in us and how he's growing in us, the less we desire to put our own work in the spotlight. So look at verse 10 and 11 as we close it out. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, that I may attain the resurrection of the dead, that I may know him. Now, if we could only just know him instead of chasing things in the world, instead of chasing accomplishments in the world and chasing goals that we're trying to meet. And those things, I'm not saying those are negative and those are bad. We should have goals for business. We should have dreams and all that. But if we are chasing only those things and we're not chasing the Lord and pursuing our relationship with him, then we've missed the point of what God's trying to do in our lives. We would just know him in the power of his resurrection. It was the resurrection and is the res resurrection of Jesus. It gives us hope for our future. It secures our hope. And then he says to share in our sufferings. Here again, as we've seen throughout this, this book and this passage, Paul keeps knocking down the door of the prosperity gospel. That as long as you do these certain things that you're gonna have health, wealth, and happiness. It says that, if you are following Jesus, then you are gonna share in his sufferings. Doesn't mean that you're gonna be crucified. Doesn't mean that you're gonna be put on a cross and displayed for everybody to see, embarrassed and mutilated and, and beaten nearly to death, hung on a cross to die as a, as, a, as a criminal. Doesn't mean that's what you're going to do, but it does mean that you are going to suffer in this world. It does mean that there's gonna be challenging situations that you don't have the answer to, which if you're like me, I, this is confession time, okay? I'm a control freak. And if I can't fix something on my own, it frustrates me. It makes me mad. It makes me disappointed. I wanna, I'm a fixer. I wanna give me something, I'll fix it, right? Sometimes we 
find ourselves in the middle of suffering where we don't have the answer, that without the resurrection and the hope of the resurrection, it would seem painful, it would seem harmful, it would seem senseless. Listen to this. Scholar Hanson Walter says it this way, without the power of the resurrection, suffering seems pointless and harsh. We are not going to have a life without suffering, but in the middle of our suffering, we see and we know that we serve a savior that was victorious over sin and death. As much as the Romans wanted to kill him and embarrass him and and, and mutilate him and all the things that they tried to do him, they couldn't finish the work because Jesus had a plan and a purpose to come to this earth to die for you and I so that we could be the righteousness of God, not in our own works, not in our own flesh, not in our own willingness, not in our own willpower in our own discipline, only in Jesus. And one day, one day we're gonna be kneeling at the throne of God singing holy, holy, holy. I know that people have a lot of questions about heaven or what the afterlife looks like, but I'm gonna know, am I gonna know somebody? Am I gonna know this person? And it's possible, it's possible not. But all I know is that when we are in the presence of God, I don't know if we're even gonna be concerned about that. We're gonna be kneeling at his throne, worshiping day and night. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And it won't won't be because of my flesh and my work and my willingness, and it won't be because of yours. It will only be because of the work of Jesus. This is why we boast in Christ and not in of ourselves. Confidence in the flesh diminishes when our boasting in Christ grows. If you bow your heads with me just for a moment like for us to have a time of reflection. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. I know it will be difficult and challenging, especially for you moms. If you could just take just a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, where, where do you need to lay down your human side? What fleshly side do you need to lay down and replace it with glory and boasting in Christ and Christ alone?